So let's look closer at our nephrons. There are two different types of capillary networks that are associated with our nephrons. Um, I talked about the glomerulus already. Um, that's the um, within that glomerular or Bowman's capsule where filtration occurs. And then we have the paratubular capillaries. So this is the glomerulus. Um, the glomerulus is going to be fed by afferent arterioles that bring blood into the capillary bed. And then efferent arterioles bring blood out of that capillary bed. And so as blood moves in, you're going to have filtration, which is a passive process, uh, occur. And so fluid's going to fill into this Bowman's capsule and move then into the proximal convoluted tubule. Any fluid that is leaked out um, that doesn't move into the proximal convoluted tubule is going to be um, brought back in to the capillaries and leave through the afferent or the efferent arterioles. And so that's going to typically be associated with differences in pressures, which we'll talk about in a little while, okay? Um, and then we have the paratubular capillary beds, which surround the um, the two the glomer the the nephron tubules. And so this is where instead of filtration, we're going to have a lot of reabsorption and secretion occur. So again, you have that glomerulus, and then here we have the paratubular capillaries. Paratubular capillaries are going to allow for secretion of materials that couldn't go through via filtration, but are waste products, and absorption of materials that went in and became part of that um, filtrate, but we don't want to lose, like water or glucose or other important um, ions that we might need. So we form urine through three basic processes. Um, we have glomerular filtration, which occurs at the or in Bowman's capsule at the um, glomerular capillaries. And so we filter out anything or any and everything that um, can fit through the capillary, um, the capillaries and those filtration slits. And then we're going to have tubular reabsorption, which reabsorbs anything that we didn't want to get rid of. Um, we have tubular secretion where um, we're getting rid of materials that couldn't get through the um, glomerular uh, filtration slits or um, didn't have a chance to get into that filtrate that we want to get rid of. So what is filtration? Filtration is a passive process in which water and solutes move um, down a concentration gradient um, through basically a very um, passive mechanism. As water's moving, solutes follow those water, the water. So as water's moving, solutes are dissolved in the water. And they just kind of move through as well. Think of um, coffee formation. So things that typically don't get through are going to be larger proteins or blood or things that have a really um, high charge or may not be able to get through. But things move on the afferent end um, out of our capillaries. And then on the efferent end, where we have less fluid, we're going to have some material move back in to that capillary and move out through the efferent capillaries or efferent arterioles, okay? Um, and then they become part of that paratubular capillary bed. 
So if we have good blood pressure, we're going to produce filtrate normally. If blood pressure drops too much, then we're not going to be able to form as much filtrate and we're going to have other problems. And that's where um, production of renin comes in, which we'll talk about again a little bit later. There we go. So reabsorption, the majority of reabsorption actually occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule. And the reason for this is the proximal convoluted tubule contains microvilli. Um, just like the uh, small intestines contain microvilli that increase absorption um, surface area for absorption, the proximal convoluted tubules also contain microvilli that increases surface area for absorption. And so we're going to absorb all the items that we don't want to lose. Um, most of the reabsorption is going to be considered an active process, so we need energy to do so. Um, some reabsorption is passive, though. And so we're going to be reabsorbing ions that we need, um, glucose, amino acids, as well as water. We're absorbing water continuously. Um, and then we're going to, sorry, secrete materials that didn't get filtered out. So things that were, um, that some ions that didn't get filtered out, proteins that are too big that we want to get rid of, um, some drugs, and some waste products like um, some hormone waste products that we might no longer need. So we get rid of, or we get rid, we secrete um, in the opposite direction as um, reabsorption. So we're just moving materials into the um, glomerular tubules, glom glomerular, I'm sorry, the nephron tubules. And we're able to do this mainly again via active transport mechanisms. So a lot of active or ATP is needed for us to produce urine and get rid of wastes. And so a lot of the material that is found in the um, filtrate or in the, I'm sorry, tubular fluid is nitrogenous waste. Um, urea, uric acid, creatinine, um, all of these are nitrogenous wastes that are going to be found in and helping in producing the urine, um, as well as we're going to have excess ions that we don't need, um, amino acids, um, well, I won't say that, I'll say hormones, drugs, or other poisons that are going to um, be reabsorb or secreted back into the fluid. And they're going to move to that collecting duct. Once they hit the collecting duct, the material is going to then um, be considered urine and it's going to move down and eventually be released. So every 24 hours we produce between one and two liters of urine. So remember, we're making close to 180 liters of filtrate, but the majority of that filtrate is reabsorbed. And so that's really important to remember. Also, think about how much blood is in your body. Um, so of the 180 liters, we're only producing about one to two liters of actual urine. The rest is reabsorbed. So what does urine look like? It's clear. So let's let's put it in perspective. We're talking about a healthy individual that is normally hydrated. We'll have clear to pale or a yellowish color. Um, urine is going to be um, typically, it's going to have a, an ammonia smell to it slightly. It should have a pH of about 6, and it should have a specific gravity that's a little bit higher than water-specific gravity. So that's normal urine. Um, things that are solutes that are normally found in urine, we might have sodium or potassium. 
urea, uric acid, creatinine, ammonia, bicarbonate, sometimes hydrogen ions also might be found in, in urine. Things that we don't want to see in urine, glucose. So if you've ever had to have a glucose urine test, um, they're checking to see if there's glucose in your urine. Um, because if there is, that's a problem. In general, glucose is always reabsorbed. Blood proteins, so like albumin. Um, we don't want to see albumin in our blood or in our urine because that means there's something not right with our filtration membrane in general. Red blood cells, again, big bad problem. Hemoglobin. White blood cells or bile. So if we have glucose in our urine, what does that possibly mean? Um, so it could mean nothing, that we've just had too much sugar, but it also could mean that we have diabetes, diabetes mellitus, I should mention that. Um, if we have protein in our urine, it could mean that we have just been um, working out a lot, so that sometimes happens, or if we're pregnant, but... Oftentimes, proteins in the urine can can lead to or can be a sign of um, glomerulo, glomerulonephritis where you have damage to that filtration membrane or seriously high blood pressure, which also can cause damage to that filtration membrane. Pus, white blood cells in our urine, usually is an indication of, in, of a urinary tract infection. Red blood cells typically associated with um, a urinary tract infection or kidney stones or kidney trauma. So if you were in an accident, that could happen too. Hemoglobin um, could mean that you have certain disease like hemolytic anemia or a transfusion reaction. So hemolytic anemia is kind of like a could be associated with a transfusion reaction as well, or not really a transfusion, I shouldn't say that, could be associated with um, having a, being RH negative and having an RH positive child. Um, or if you have bile pigment, that's usually associated with hepatitis. So at this point, you should be able to tell me um, what the two capillary beds associated with the nephron are, what the three functions um, that are used to help produce urine are and where they occur, what the normal components of urine are and what abnormal components of urine are and what they might mean. I'm going to stop here and we'll get into the next um, video. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, wait. I just like pushed way too many times. There we go. Um, we'll get into the next video shortly. Bye.